Uh, I took an extended sabbatical for medical practice to go around the United States and meet with uh, school boards and community groups. Because I thought, look, if, if you share this evidence with them, they'll change, right? Uh, no, not right. It was a very discouraging experience because I learned that public schools in the United States are political first and foremost. Uh, they are not at all evidence-based. Uh, so it is discouraging. Uh, but as far as changing the culture, you know, you and I don't have the power to change the culture of Instagram or to change Hollywood, but you can change what's going on in your own home. Many parents are discouraged. They feel like there's nothing I can do, all the other kids are doing this, I don't want my kid to be left out. That's the parent I'm speaking to. And I want to encourage that parent and say, you can do this. And I will give more examples as we go along in the next hour. So we're going to break at 10 minutes to 10 for the final prayer. Uh, but I'm going to try and cover, we got another 120 slides to get through in the next hour. So I'm going to talk a little bit faster. Uh, when to move on and when to persist. Again, what's the difference between ro being robust and anti-fragile? You need to help your child determine her motivation. Your daughter says she wants to be an actress. All right. You need to dig a little deeper. Why do you want to be an actress? And if she mentions a word about fame or Hollywood or the Academy Awards, that's not the right motivation. There's a hundred, more than 100,000 members of the Screen Actors Guild. There's more than 100,000 people who would like to be acting full time. Fewer than 2% of them make a living from acting. Fewer than two out of 100. Uh, but if she says, look, I just love going on stage and, and the challenge of trying to be someone else. Okay, that's, that's a better answer. What's her motivation? Help your child to assess their strength. Practical wisdom, we used to call that. The problem is our pop American popular culture no longer teaches that. On the contrary, it teaches us the opposite. Uh, so this becomes your job. You have to help your child to be able to change their dream. So your daughter's dream is to get into Stanford. You know what? That's not a good dream. For several reasons. First of all, it's fragile. It doesn't depend on her. You can read any number of stories of kids who had perfect grades, perfect test scores, and they were rejected because they didn't fit whatever the admissions office was looking for. And it will, it's a bad dream because it will lead her to be risk averse. Uh, most the, the events I do most often are events for schools where I meet with teachers and meet with students. And I have met with any number of girls who, well, for example, one girl really was interested in computer science and was thinking of taking it, but she decided not to because she wasn't sure if she could get an A. And she was worried if she got a B or a C, that would ruin her chances of getting into the top university. So she signed up for another year of Spanish. Well, she is, she comes from a home where they speak Spanish, so she's going to ace that. Doesn't really excite her. She's choosing courses not on the basis of what her interests are, but on the basis of what she thinks she can get an A in. That's the result of the wrong dream. If your dream is about getting into Stanford, that's the wrong dream because Stanford's just a means to an end. If your daughter says her dream is to get into Stanford, ask her why. And if she says, well, Stanford has a really strong program in urban planning and design, stronger than any other. Okay, that's a good answer. But then she says, well, Stanford's the greatest. That's not the best answer. Because that's linked to prestige and this whole American notion of being famous and being impressive to other people. Your daughter says she wants to run a marathon? Great, that's a good goal. But if she says her dream is to represent the United States in the women's marathon event at the Olympics, that's not such a good goal. Because it doesn't really depend on Look, world-class marathoners are ectomorphs. That's Lynette Basai, world-class marathoner. Ectomorph, that means long legs, 
long legs, short torso. World-class soccer players have a different body type. They are mesomorphs, short legs, long torso. Mia Hamm, shown there. Great soccer player, but she is a mesomorph. She is a body type of a great soccer player. She didn't develop that. Your body type is determined at birth. You are mesomorph, ectomorph, endomorph. Those are innate factors. Again, the net beside, ectomorph, meaning long legs, short torso. Uh, uh, Mia Hamm, short legs, long torso. Those are innate factors. You cannot change them. Your child cannot change them. Mia Hamm's a great athlete, but she could never have won the New York City Marathon, no matter how hard she tried. American culture is now permeated with this notion of you can be anything you want to be if you just try hard enough. That's not true. It's not a true statement. It is a false statement. Mayhem wanted to be a world-class marathoner. It would never have happened. You have to match your dream to your strengths. Help your daughter, your son to identify their true strengths and to find the right dream. And again, they're immersed in a culture which is going to teach them the wrong dream. That's part of your job. So, not quite two months ago, I spoke at Averroes High School, which is in the East Bay, Northern California. It's south of San Francisco and just north of Mount View, Los Altos, Palo Alto, i.e. Silicon Valley. <coughs> so these kids who attend this high, it's an Islamic high school, and these kids attending this high school are immersed in stories of the kid who lives two blocks away, who created this app when he was 16 and sold it for $30 million two years later. And they know these kids. They are immersed in these stories. And Sheikh Allah Hedin asked us, he said, what does it mean? There is no God but God. What does that mean? That's Sheikh Allah Hedin, who I had the privilege of hearing two months ago. He said, if your dream is to launch a company and sell it for $30 million, and, and your passion is all about your app, your startup, that is your God. If your dream is to be rich and famous, and to amaze everyone with how awesome you are, that is your God. But Sheikh al said to us over and over again in this talk, he said, there is no God but God. The problem, Sheikh al said, is that your kid is immersed in a culture it's all about being famous, being wealthy, developing the next great app, the next great startup. And that becomes their God. And it's your job to teach your child there is no God but God. It is not easy. And it's harder now because of a fourth factor. We've addressed three major factors that undermine parenting in the United States today. And the fourth factor is social media. This has happened very quickly. 14 years ago, Facebook did not exist. Eight years ago, Instagram did not exist. According to Nielsen, more than half of American girls at age 12 are now on Instagram. It didn't exist eight years ago. And yet it is now embedded in the lives of many American girls. To understand why that matters, and why it matters for girls more than it matters for boys, I want you to imagine a girl living in ancient times. By ancient times, I mean 1998, 20 years ago. <laughs> so it's the evening. She's writing in her diary, by which I mean she's writing with a pen and a bound volume of blank pages. She's writing about who she likes, who she doesn't like, the kind of girl she most admires, the kind of woman she hopes to become. She's doing some important work. The great American psychologist, Dr. Abraham Maslow, said that figuring out who you are and what you want is not trivial. He believed that many 
adults were miserable because they were working hard at jobs they don't like in pursuit of goals that were not meaningful to them. So this girl writing five pages about what she wants. She's doing some important work. Fast forward to today. When I meet with students, I'll ask them, okay, who's on Instagram? Almost all the hands go up. Who's on Facebook? A few hands go up. Who's on Snapchat? All the hands go up. Who here has a diary? In an auditorium of 400 kids, three hands go up. The diary has been crowded out by social media. And then I ask the kids, well, what's the difference between posting on Instagram and writing in your diary? And one girl says, the diary is private, Instagram is public. Bingo, that's right. Well, when researchers look at how kids are using social media, they don't find any five-page essays about what I want out of life. They don't find essays at all. They find photos. And this is true for girls, and it's true for boys. Who posts more photos, uh, girls or boys? Well, girls do. How much more? 50% more, 80% more? No, it's 500% more. Girls post five times as many photos as the boys do, and the photos are different. So when a girl both go to a football game, they both take pictures of the game. But turns out the boy is taking a picture of the game, or the pretty cheerleader at the game. The girl's turning the phone on herself. And she's taking 100 selfies at the game. And then that evening she comes home and she looks through her 100 selfies and she finds uh, two or three where she's laughing and the other kids around her are laughing. And that's what she posts on her Instagram. Here I am at the game, we had a great time. She's not living, she's performing. The difference between the diary and the Instagram is the difference between living and performing. Diary is about living. It's about figuring out who you want, who you are, what you want. Instagram is a performance. Now, there's nothing wrong with a performance as long as you understand that the performance comes to an end and you take off your mask and resume your real life. My concern is that for many American kids, and this is more true for girls than for boys, they're trapped in what I call the cyber bubble, the 24-7 texting and social media, and the performance never ends. And it is exhausting, and it is draining. These girls are hyper-connected to other kids their own age, but they are disconnected from themselves. Disconnected from themselves. The more time a girl spends on social media, the more likely she is to become depressed. So here's a study in which researchers recruited kids middle school kids, and then followed them over time. And they find that the more time kids spend on Instagram looking at other kids' Instagram, or looking to see how many likes they got on their own Instagram, the more likely they are to become depressed. And this is true for boys, but it's a much bigger effect for girls. What activities prevent or decrease the risk of becoming depressed? Engaging in sport, attending a religious service, reading a book, Doing homework protects you against depression if you're an eighth grader. What most increases the risk of becoming depressed? Social networking. So I met with Kathy Charles at her office. Different cohort, different studies, same results. Following kids over time, the more time kids spend on social media, the more likely they are to become anxious and depressed, but there was a bigger effect for girls than for boys. When I met with Professor Charles, she didn't know why. She, she could not explain the gender effect in her own finding. So she was very interested when I shared with her other research showing that girls are very ready to believe that other girls are having more fun than they are. That other girls' lives are more interesting than their own life. This turns out to be not at all true for boys. Turns out that boys greatly overestimate how interesting their own life is to other people. And girls use social media differently. So a girl and a boy both get sick, they both throw up. The boy posts a photo of his own vomit on his Instagram. Girls never do that. So now put all these findings together and you understand the uh, empirical finding. If you imagine a girl sitting in her bedroom, a girl 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age, sitting in her bedroom looking at all the other girls' Instagram. There's 
Sonia at the football game, she's having a great time. There's Vanessa with the new puppy, isn't it cute? I'm just sitting there not doing anything. My life sucks. The more time a girl spends on Instagram, the more likely she is to become depressed, and that's a bigger effect for girls than it is for boys. And you now know three reasons why that is so. First of all, the girl's more invested in what she's posting. If you don't like Jason's photo of the pretty cheerleader, he doesn't care. But if you don't like Emily's photo of Emily, she's going to take it more personally. Girls and boys use social media differently. This boy looking at Jacob's vomit or Brad's dog that just got run over by a car is less likely to want to be that boy. But the girls are only posting the fun stuff, the happy stuff. And boys frankly overestimate how interesting their own life is to begin with. So girls are more vulnerable to the toxic effects of social media, but only somewhat. I have also boys who are clearly vulnerable and susceptible. So what can you do about it? Well, first step is to realize most kids are not masters of time management. So in this Study, they asked this girl, how much time were you on Instagram last night? She said, 40 minutes? It was more than two hours. But I don't think she was lying. I think she lost track of time. You need to install one of these apps, like My Mobile Watchdog or NetDaddy Mobile. And the first thing the app will do is report, and it needs to be on every device your kid has. And your kid must be accountable. And this is a much bigger problem in affluent communities than in low-income communities. Because in affluent communities, your kid may have $200 that they got from their uncle for their birthday. If you got $200, you can go to Best Buy and buy an uh, on-demand phone, and the parents don't even know you have it. In affluent communities, it is now common to find that kids have phones the parents don't even know about. You need to explain to your kid, this is not acceptable. You need to explain to relatives, do not give my child gifts of money. Don't take this for granted. Your kid is immersed in a toxic culture. If you want to protect them from the toxic culture, it is your job. You've got to be the strict parent. And you must explain to your kid, no device that I'm not aware of. Any device you have belongs to me, no matter who paid for it. I'm responsible. And here are the rules under which you will use the device. And again, many parents are skeptical. They're like, oh, come on, my, my daughter's just going to Google the phrase, how do I get around parental controls on that Well, I've met with the people who write code for some of these things. I've done a great many events across Silicon Valley. And I can tell you that Ned Nanny and MSpy have employees whose full-time job is to Google the phrase, how do I get around parental controls on Ned Nanny? And if they find that a kid has found a hole, they patch it within hours, and your app will update. You'll hear parents say, oh, come on, these apps don't work. Kids can just work around them. I have never found a parent who said that who actually had that experience. The parent is saying that as an excuse not to deploy the app. They don't want their kid to think that they are the strict parent. The parents are looking for an excuse to rationalize their behavior. This is unknown outside North America. But this is very characteristic of American parents, that they don't want to be responsible. They don't want to be the strict parent. And explain to your kid, look, I'm going to install this app on your device. I will know every website you visit and what you do there because that's my job as your parent. I will know what you're doing, and if I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device. Look, my parents insisted on knowing where I was at all times. I have to know where you are at all times, because now it's not there, it's online. It's part of my job, and it is. Many kids are going to bed with their phone turned on, and at two in the morning, your daughter is getting a text, OMG. Sonia and Jason just broke up. This is really big news. We'll have to talk about this. And they're up for an hour in the middle of the night exchanging text messages. This is your job. Look, the rules of good parenting have not changed in 20 years. 20 years ago, a girl could not ex accept a phone call at 2 in the morning to gossip because the phone would ring. 
and the parents would not allow it. His parents knew it was more important for kids to get a good night's sleep than to be up for an hour in the middle of the night exchanging gossip. That was true 20 years ago, and it's still true today. What has changed is the technology. It's now very easy for your daughter to accept a text at 2 in the morning because the phone never rang. It buzzed. She has it on vibrate mode. And she's not talking. She's texting. But just because it's technically easy doesn't mean it should happen. This is your job. You know, some of the problems we're addressing this evening are not easy to fix. This one's real easy to fix. At 9 o'clock at night, the very latest, you say, device is off. You take the device, you switch it off, and you put it in the charger which stays in the parent's bedroom. She can have it back tomorrow morning. Now, when you get home this evening, and you explain to your daughter that you attended a presentation by Dr. Leonard Sachs, and Dr. Sachs recommends that you take the phone every night at 9 and switch it off and put it in the charger, she may not applaud. She may protest. She may say, but I use it as my alarm clock. Let her know they still make actual alarm clocks. She can go to the store and buy one. And now she really gets upset. She says, but what if there's an emergency? Remind her that you still have a house phone, a landline, in the parent's bedroom. And if there's a true emergency, her friend is welcome to call, and you, the parent, will pick up, and you, the parent, will decide whether this emergency warrants waking her up at 2 in the morning. It can probably wait. This is your job. Again, many American parents will say, well, I think it's, it's wiser to let kids decide. In some domains, that may be true. Not in this domain. What is your daughter supposed to say tomorrow morning in school? When a friend says, hey, I texted you last night at midnight, how come you didn't answer? Is she supposed to say, well, researchers have found that sleep deprivation in adolescence is a major risk factor in the etiology of a person. No, no, that's ridiculous. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents take my phone every night at night. I won't have it back to the next morning. This is your job. No devices in the bedroom. No phones in the bedroom. This is not just my opinion. These are the official guidelines of the American Academy of Pediatrics. In your handout, you will find link to the full text of the American Academy guidelines. No internet access that is not supervised. That's, again, not my opinion. That is the considered opinion of the experts of the American Academy who spent years studying every relevant uh, research and scholarly investigation on this topic, there should be no expectation of privacy when your child is online. Those are the AAP guidelines. The device should be in a public space, like the kitchen or the living room. Scholars define sexting as sending or receiving an obscene photo. They define it obscene as the nipple of the female breast is exposed or the genitalia exposed. Sexting, per se, is unusual. But what's becoming very common is girls sending provocative photos, I say in a swimsuit, and posting them on Instagram or sending them by Snapchat. New York Magazine devoted an entire issue. I cropped the photo. Uh, but this is very common. We have a great deal of research now showing that this is harmful, that girls who post such photos are more likely to agree with statements like how you look matters more than who you are. Girls who post such photos are more likely to become anxious, less likely to be academically engaged. So a girl I know well in my own practice was asked by another girl who I don't know. The other girl said, hey, how about I take some pictures of you taking your clothes off? You take some pictures of me taking my clothes off and we'll send them to our, our boyfriends. Incidentally, studies in the United States, every study conducted in the last four years has found that at least half, more than 50% of American teenage girls now engage in this kind of behavior, sending photos that they've taken of themselves, partially clothed, uh, and sending them to their boyfriends. This is now very common. So what's a girl supposed to say? Well, what she actually did say was, I can't do that because my parents have installed this app on my phone. Every photo I take goes immediately to my mom's phone and to her laptop before I can do anything with it. Here, go ahead. And so her friend took a photo and then called mom at work and said, hey, Mr. Patrick, we just took a picture. 
uh, can you see it? And Mom's like, uh, yeah, um, the flowers, uh, gardenias in a vase. Um, uh, okay, thanks, bye. And the girl who had proposed the striptease said, wow, that's amazing, she said. I wish my parents cared about me that much. They have no idea what I do with my phone. And the striptease did not happen. Now, during Q and A at a, another one of these presentations, a father said, "I don't, I don't understand why the striptease didn't happen. They could have still done it using the other girl's phone." Well, in your handout, you'll find two studies of actual sexting, where researchers interviewed kids who were taking obscene photos of themselves and sending them to their friends, and they asked every girl and every boy, "Why are you doing this?" And the most common reason the boy gives is because he really enjoys doing it. But then you ask the girl, why are you doing it? And the most common reason the girl gives is some variation on, well, I wish I didn't have to. And the researcher says, what do you mean you wish you didn't? You don't have to. No one's holding your gun to your head to make you do this. And the girl says, yeah, but this school, you know, if you're one of the cool kids, it's just what you do. I don't think either girl really wanted to do it. And the fact that the parents had installed this app gave both girls an excuse not to. You need to give your daughter an excuse to say no. You need to recognize that she is immersed in a toxic American culture where girls are judged and rated by how they look in a swimsuit. You don't want her to be doing this. Now some parents will say, oh, you know, none of this applies to my daughter. We're Muslim. Dr. Sachs is not Muslim. Uh, my daughter is, you know, a very good girl and she wears a head covering. She'd never do anything like that. All right, Dr. Hamzabi. Asra Hamzabi, where is she hiding? There she is. Um, so, Dr. Hamzabi was kind enough to talk with me a few years ago when, we, when I talked on this topic. And um, indeed, you will find Muslim parents who think none of this applies to my daughter. Uh, my daughter would never do such a thing. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hamzabi wants you to know that, no, you're not exempt. That young people are not safeguarded just because they are Muslim. If they're living in this country, they are vulnerable. And parents must be knowledgeable and vigilant and Dr. Usra Hamzabi has told me she is willing to talk with you if you uh, uh, would like to learn more of her insight and her wisdom. Um, so I visited a leading independent school, K-12 school. 12-year-old girl had a 14-year-old boyfriend. He asked her to send him some photos. Nothing raunchy. He just wanted to see her pull off her blouse to reveal her bra keeping her bra on. So she went in her bedroom, closed the door, locked the door, and did as the boy had asked, and sent him some photos as she pulled off her blouse, uh, sent the photos to him using Snapchat. Snapchat claims that you can send a photo using Snapchat and set it, say, with a five-second self-destruct, and after the five seconds after the recipient has seen the photo for five seconds, it will vanish. And if the recipient tries to save the photo using a screenshot, you, the sender, will be notified. Snapchat knows that claim to be false. They know that there are dozens of free apps out there that allow you to capture the photo without the sender being notified. She didn't know that. The boy captured all the photos she sent. School administrators later determined he never intended for anyone else to see the photos. But he was at a party, and he set his phone down to grab some chips and talk to his friend. He his back to his phone. When I meet with students, I tell them, look, if you have one of these phones, it never leaves your person. It's always in your pocket. If you're a girl and you don't have a pocket, it's always in your purse against your body. That's basic digital hygiene. Well, no one had taught this boy that. So he set his phone down. Another boy came over, saw the phone, picked up the phone saw the gallery, forwarded these girls photo, this girl's photos to his own phone, exited the gallery, set the phone back down exactly where it had been. First boy didn't know anything had happened. Second boy then posted all the photos on his own Instagram. Within three days, everyone at the school had seen them. Boys this girl didn't even know were coming up to her and saying, 
Hey, Vanessa, how about you put on a striptease for us? She'd been invited to a three-day girls-only ski weekend. The birthday girl whose parents were hosting the ski weekend called her up and said, you know, I hate to make this phone call, but my mom is totally freaking out because all the other girls' moms are calling my mom and saying, if you're going to be there, they won't let their daughter come because they now think you're some kind of bad influence, so I have to uninvite you. I'm really sorry. I have to uninvite you. This girl collapsed, hysterical crying, started cutting herself with razor blades, said her life was over, that the photos would always be out there, which is true. Other boys had picked up the photos and were reposting them. Parents took her to the doctor. The doctor prescribed Lexapro 10 milligrams and recommended counseling. That accomplished nothing. She now have a 12-year-old girl refusing to go to school and meeting criteria for depression, which is not responding to Lexapro or counseling. Who's at fault? The girl, her boyfriend, the other boy, no, they're kids. The grown-ups are to blame. Look, this is a very powerful device. With this device, I can take a photo and send the photo, and once I send that photo, I have no control over what happens to that photo. That is a very grown-up functionality. If you're going to put such a device in the hands of a minor child, then you, the parent, are responsible for every photo they take. So I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal. Link is in your handout. And I'm very specific in my recommendations based on the research. At what age? Is it reasonable for a child to have a smartphone, a phone that can take a photo and send a photo? Certainly no child under 13 should have such a phone, and most 13-year-olds are not ready for it. And if you're going to give your child a smartphone, then you must install on the phone an app like NetNanny Mobile, my mobile watchdog, and explain to your kid, if I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device indefinitely. Or just don't give your child a phone. And then parents will say, oh, come on, that's totally unrealistic. You know, my daughter's doing all these activities, computer coding, coding class, soccer. What happens if her ride doesn't show up? There aren't any pay phones out there anymore. I don't want her going up to a stranger asking to borrow their phone. Okay, I get that. I'm the father of a daughter. That's not an argument for a smartphone. That's an argument for a dumb phone. by which I mean a phone that can make a phone call and receive a phone call, and that's all it can do. There are many such phones available. Uh, you don't know about them because they're not marketed to you. They're marketed to the elderly. Uh, my father-in-law is 82, and that's his phone. Uh, it has uh, large digits, large display, and the battery lasts forever. It charges about once every other month. It doesn't need 4G, it doesn't need 3G, it works everywhere. That takes care of the safety concern. You give your daughter one of these, and if her ride doesn't show up, she can call you. But do not give your kid a smartphone. Or if you do give them a smartphone, you must install on the phone an app and explain to them, I will see every photo you take before you do anything with it. If I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device indefinitely. And many parents push back in this country, not elsewhere. I've done this talk in many countries overseas. And in England, in Scotland, in Germany, in Italy, in Switzerland, in Australia, New Zealand, parents are like, of course. In this country, they're like, oh, I can never do that. I can never do that. American parent says, look, I don't want to violate my daughter's privacy. I respect my daughter's privacy. If she doesn't want me to see her photo, I'm fine with that. I don't want to see her photo if she doesn't want me to see it. And I say to that parent, look, the most important thing you must teach your daughter or your son is that there's no such thing as privacy to any photo that you share electronically. Privacy, that's great. Here's how you share a photo privately. You print it out on a piece of photo paper. And then you go over to your friend's house and show it to them and then shred it. That's privacy. There is no privacy to any photo that you share electronically. And I found the three magic words that really help to communicate that story. And the three magic words are General David Petraeus. 
In case you don't recall the story, David Petraeus graduated top of his class at West Point, first of his class at Fort Leavenworth, Brigadier General, earned a doctorate at Princeton, Brigadier General at age 46, George W. Bush appointed him Commanding General, Barack Obama appointed him Director of the CIA. You would think he would know that there is no such thing as privacy, but somehow he didn't get the memo. And he and his mistress thought, oh, we're so smart, we've got our passwords, nobody will ever find out. This is career over. What's the moral of the story of David Petraeus and Paula Bravo? Well, there are several morals. One moral is don't cheat on your spouse. Another moral is don't share anything electronically unless you're prepared for everyone to see it. And you don't teach that by preaching it. You teach that virtue by inculcating virtuous habits and by not allowing bad habits to form. By saying to your kid, I will see every photo you take. And if I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device. <coughs> so I've done a great many events in Colorado. Fly to Denver, drive south to Colorado Springs, make a right turn, go to Canyon City. Little town, lovely little bedroom community, great place to raise a family, everyone says. More than 100 students at Kenton City High School were exchanging obscene photos that they had taken of themselves. They were using a vault app. Looks like a calculator. You look at your kid's phone, you see a calculator. You tap on it, it's a full function calculator. But you enter the four or five digit password and the calculator vanishes and reveals a vault of obscene photos. All the popular kids were doing it. Parents demanded the principal resign, which made no sense. Police investigators determined most of the sharing was happening on weekend afternoons. The principal has no jurisdiction over what kids do in their bedroom on the weekend. The parents failed to recognize the culprit is the person in the mirror. It's the parents. If any one of those parents had installed an app like NetNanny Mobile, My Mobile Watchdog on their kid's phone, they would have realized what was happening. None of the parents had installed monitoring software using excuses like, oh, the kids will figure out a way around it, so why bother? That is characteristic of American parents. If you're 16 years old and you take an obscene photo of yourself and send it to a 16-year-old, your friend, you have produced and distributed child pornography. That is a class three felony. Punishable by up to six years in prison and requiring that you register as a convicted sex offender anywhere you live in the United States for the next 20 years. It is not wiped clean. Don't put your kid in this situation. Don't use excuses to be an American parent. If you're going to give your kid a smartphone, it's your responsibility to know what they're doing with it. And an American parent said to me recently, oh, I think I'm up to speed. You know, I'm pretty tech savvy. I look at my kid's phone, and uh, I check to see what apps have been installed recently and make sure I understand what the app does. I don't think I need one of those monitoring apps. It seems kind of invasive and intrusive. Look, only legitimate apps show up. The makers of the vault apps hide the app. They will not show up when you look at the phone. These apps are sophisticated. If the kid's looking at the vault app and the parent comes in the room, all the kid has to do is casually shake the phone and the app vanishes. If the parent discovers the app and says, hey, it's requiring a password, you give the parent a dummy password. 5378 opens the app, takes them to the gallery of the photos of the cousins and the babies. A dummy password. There is an arms race going on. The app makers are developing more sophisticated apps to fool you. And the parents don't even have a clue that the arms race is going on. Parents say, you know, I think I can tell just looking at my kid's phone. That's what the app looks like. Gallery Ball alone has had more than 10 million downloads from American teens. You're not up to speed. The notion that you can look at anyone's phone and have any idea how they are using the phone is very 2007. 
It might have been true 11 years ago. It is not true today. The lesson of Canyon City High School is if you're going to get your kid a smartphone, you must install on the phone a monitoring app and explain to your kid, if I see anything inappropriate, you lose the device. The people making the apps are on top of these issues. The apps work. I have no affiliation with any of these apps. Best practice, based on the research, either install the app or give your kid a dumb phone. Look, things have changed. 20 years ago, there used to be a public service announcement that would come on American television at 10 o'clock at night. It's 10 o'clock, you know where your kids are. And those of us who were born and raised in this country, we remember this ad. And we think, oh, I'm a good parent, because it's 10 o'clock, my daughter's home alone in her bedroom upstairs. But if she's got a smartphone, your daughter could be uploading pornography, your son could be downloading pornography. She could be engaged in cyberbullying, he could be a victim of cyberbullying. Your job is to be the parent. And many American parents want to be their kid's best friend. But a friend is a peer. A friend cannot command. A friend cannot say, look, I will not allow you to pick out on ice cream right before supper. A parent can say that. A friend can say, hey, I'm taking your device away so you can get some sleep. But a parent can say that, and a parent must say that. If you're going to give your kid a Smartphone, you must install a monitoring app on it. And some parents understand that and go even a step further. One parent sent her daughter an anonymous text. Hey, I'll stop by noon time. you send me some pictures? And the daughter responded, no, I know this is you, Mom. Please stop. <laughs> Proud of you, honey. Keep making good choices. Love, Mom. So what really matters? What should our first priority be? parents. Longitudinal cohort studies in which kids are followed from birth right through into their 30s. What predicts the outcomes in, in adulthood? Virtue and character. Self-control. How do you measure self-control when a child is 9, 12, or 14 years of age? You don't talk to the kid, you talk to the classmates and the parent and then the teachers and say, can this kid wait? Can they take turns? Can they listen? Low self-control at age 12 predicts a high risk of drug and alcohol use 20 years down the road. High self-control at age 12 predicts a low risk of drug and alcohol use 20 years later. Low self-control at age 12 predicts a high risk of financial struggles 20 years later. High self-control predicts a low risk of financial struggles 20 years later. Low self-control at age 12 predicts a low credit rating 20 years later. High self-control at age 12 predicts a high credit rating 20 years later. What really matters? What should our top priority be as parents? It should be teaching virtue and character. That is not a sermon. It is a robust empirical finding. I devoted two chapters of The Collapse of Parenting to reviewing every relevant longitudinal cohort study. And every one of them comes to the same conclusion, that virtue and character predict good outcomes. And the funny thing is American parents used to teach that. American parents used to say things like, Hey, I'd rather you get a C on the test, honestly, than cheat and get an A. But it's now common to find American parents, especially in affluent communities, saying things like, hey, you want to get into Princeton? You've got to have amazing grades. You're not just competing against American kids anymore. You're competing against kids from East Asia, South Asia, Europe. And there's been an explosion in cheating among American kids over the past 20 years, which I document. What parameter measured when a child is 12 years of age? powerfully predicts health and wealth and happiness 20 years down the road. It is self-control and other measures of conscientiousness, like honesty. Research has been known for many years that every human personality can be mapped in a five-dimensional space. The five dimensions of human personality are conscientiousness and its sub-traits of self-control and honesty, openness to new ideas, friendliness and agreeableness, emotional stability, and extroversion and introversion. Some traits are difficult to change. And personality does become more fixed as we age. But even young adults can change. And it turns out that self-control and honesty are very amenable to change. They are not innate. You must teach them. How do you teach your child to be more self-controlled? You say, no dessert 
until you eat your broccoli. No games until all the chores are done and all the homework is done. And if has, that has not been your practice, I encourage you to sit down with your children and explain. We've been doing some things wrong. We're going to make some changes. No devices at the dinner table. No earbuds or headsets in the car. No dessert until you eat your broccoli. No games until the chores are done and the homework is done. And if that has not been the practice in your home and you make that announcement, there will be an explosion. And the older the child, the bigger the explosion. But if both parents stand their ground after six weeks, six weeks, you will have a child with better self-control and a happier family. I've seen it and the research shows it. So the job of the parent then is to teach virtue and self-control. Well, that requires that you teach from a position of authority. If you say to your kid, you know, I personally, I, would, I don't think I would cheat on a test, you know, but, but that's just me. You know, you do you. you know, whatever feels right. If it feels right, do it. Yeah. Well, that's not teaching. That's nothing. I have been a doctor in this country for 32 years. I have witnessed firsthand the collapse of American parenting. As recently as 20 years ago, American parents were comfortable saying, do unto others. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. But today, it's much more common to find American parents who don't command. Instead, the, the command has, has morphed into a question. And the question is usually something like, well, how, how would you feel if someone did that to you? And the parent has no idea what to say when the son responds. If someone did that to me, I'd kick him in the nuts and then I'd sit on his face. <laughs> Teach humility. Many Americans misunderstand humility. And one mother said to me, look, I don't want to teach my daughter to be humble. I want her to have high self-esteem so when that job come, offer comes along, she'll go for it. I don't want to teach her to be humble. And I said to that parent, you know, with all due respect, you are confused. You are con confusing being humble with being timid. They're not the same thing. Indeed, they're almost opposites. I said, and the virtue you're thinking of is not self-esteem. Self-esteem is not a virtue. The virtue you're thinking of is called courage. Courage means that you know your shortcomings, but you find the strength to push forward anyhow. How to teach humility. Well, I devote a chapter to the book to how parents have actually done it successfully living here in this country. And one strategy is chores. And again, you'll find affluent parents who say, oh, you know, my child's got all these activities and all this homework, and, you know, we can afford to hire someone to do the house chores for her. The unintended message is you're too important to be bothered. And the result is bloated self-esteem. And again, American schools contributed to this. As in an American school, a third grade classroom, and the assignment was to write your name on a white piece of paper and attach to your name five adjectives describing how amazing you are. And Mateo here has written a genius, misspelled, excellent, misspelled, talented, awesome, and marvelous. I'm not picking on Mateo, he's just doing the assignment. There's no awareness on the part of the school how puffing up Bloated self-esteem leads to narcissism and to resentment. Researchers at UCLA compared the most popular television shows on American television from 1960 to 2010 and looked to see what was value, what was the show teaching about what's important. And they found great consistency from 1960 to 2000. Andy Griffith showed in the 1960s, Happy Days in the 1970s, Family Ties in the 1980s, Sabrina the Teenage Witch in the 1990s. All of those shows taught that what is most important is being a good person, being kind, being liked, being part of. Those were one, two, and three. For 40 years, being famous and being wealthy were number 15 and number 16 out of 16 for 40 years. Then between 2000 and 2010, American culture flipped. And 
And suddenly, being famous and wealthy went from being number 16 to being number one. The most popular shows in 2010, like Survivor, American Idol, High Carly, The Voice, it's all about being famous and being wealthy. Being a kind person on Survivor, that's for losers. And since then, it's only gotten worse. The new cult of fame and wealth, as the UCLA research is called, didn't uh, originate with Bruno Mars. But he and his elk certainly embody it and celebrate it. And conversely, if you're not famous and wealthy, you're a loser. That's the lesson of contemporary American culture. I took this photo in Times Square. Pepsi slogan, live for now. Don't worry about the sugar, live for now. If it feels good, do it, live for now. Whatever floats your boat. The problem is that American culture deliberately undermines self-control and overvalues fame and wealth, devalues virtue and character. What is childhood for? What's the point? Well, literally, a four-year-old horse is a mature adult. The Kentucky Derby is raced with three-year-olds. A four-year-old human has barely begun. And a horse is a bigger animal than a human. What is the point? Why is childhood so long? We don't have to guess. We have scholars who studied this. And I cite them in the book Labs of Derby. And the answer they give is that it takes many years for parents to teach the child what the child needs to know. There is no equivalent in the animal kingdom of human culture. That's a defining characteristic of our species. So what can you do about it? Last 20 minutes, let's wrap it up. We began this evening by talking about how American culture has changed, the breaking of bonds across generation. You must restore the bonds. You must eat supper with your child. No screens at the dinner table. Frank Elgar and his colleagues interviewed more than 10,000 adolescents coast to coast and asked them, in the last seven days, how many evening meals have you had at home with a parent? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And, they, and then they measured internalizing problems like anxiety and depression, externalizing problems like hitting the wall and anger, positive well-being, pro-social behavior, and life satisfaction, and found a huge effect. Not only zero to seven, but almost every step along the way. Let's compare five evening meals a week with six evening meals a week. Going from five to six, you see a significant decrease in anxiety and depression, a significant decrease in externalizing problems, a significant increase in positive well-being, pro-social behavior, and life satisfaction. And yet, what has happened? In 1992, researchers asked teenagers, in the last 24 hours, have you had a meal at home with parent? In 1992, two-thirds of teenagers said, yes, I have. In 2005, two-thirds of teenagers said, no, I have not. That's a huge change in a short period of time. We've got to fight for supper at home. So my wife and I went to the new car dealer, and when, they, when the salesman learned that we had a daughter, he wanted to sell us the rear seat entertainment system and gave us this flyer. Okay, let's look at this flyer. The two kids are looking at a screen. They've got headsets on. Mom is looking back at her kids, smiling as if to say, hey, this is great. We could drive to Chicago and never have to talk to my kids at all. What are we thinking? Everybody's busy. Time in the car is special. It's private time. No earbuds, no headsets in the car. When your child is in the car with you, you should be listening to her, and she should be listening to you, not to Justin Bieber or Miley Cyrus or Bruno Mars. And parents will say, oh yeah, but you know, my daughter's school, they got all this homework, and, my, and she's got to do it online, and you know, she's on her computer till midnight. Ban the bedroom, no devices in the bedroom. Insist that she do her homework on the laptop in the kitchen where you are sitting. And the homework's done by 8.30, she's in bed by 9. She wasn't lying, she didn't realize how much time she was spending on Instagram and shopping sites. And I want you to know I practice what I preach. Uh, I'm in the kitchen answering emails on my laptop. My daughter attends a school that unfortunately has a lot of homework online, can only be done online. She's sitting doing her homework online, and she started whistling the Bach Little Few. 
And I came in on the second voice, and my wife came in on the third voice, and we kind of got through it. It was a great little family moment, but no words were spoken. Typical American family, especially this is especially true of affluent families, mother, father, son, and daughter come home, and within five minutes, researchers find they're in a different, each of them is in a different room of the house, looking at a different screen. You cannot have a family life if the family is not physically together. Ban the bedroom. No screens in the bedroom. That's the official guideline of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Nothing in the bedroom but a bed. The TV should be in a common room. I practiced what I preached 10 years ago. I recruited my wife's parents to move in with us. My parents are both dead. And we've been together for 10 years. Uh, that's my father-in-law, the one with the dumb phone, with his back of the fire. There is our TV in our common room. That's his wife, my wife, my daughter. Not necessarily trying to entertain each other, but physically together. This was common 50 years ago. It is rare today. It costs nothing to do this. And there's our group selfie. That's my wife, my mother-in-law, my daughter, and my father-in-law. Choose vacations that will bridge the generations. That means outdoors, unplugged vacations. Call the vacation lodge and ask, hey, do you folks have really good wireless access? Uh, you do? Okay. Sorry, we're going somewhere else. And when she asks if she's allowed to bring a friend along on the ski vacation, the answer is no. Because if she brings, brings a friend along, it's going to be her and her friend going up on the chairlift. And all you've done is to subsidize a very expensive play date. It needs to be you and her on the chairlift. That's the point of the vacation, is to strengthen the bonds within the family. And when the chairlift stops and you're dangling 50 feet above the snow, that's a great time to have a conversation. Looking at Caroline, I find parents picking up their seven-year-old and going directly from school to soccer practice and then to a play date, and they're eating in the car on the way from soccer practice to the play date. And the unintended message is that time at home with family, a meal at home with family is the lowest priority. That it's more important for you to have fun with your friends than for you to have time at home with your family. Don't send that message. That's an American message. It's a toxic and unhealthy message. Cancel the play date. Make a family date instead. Prioritize the family. Time at home is more important than time with other kids. And American parents will say, well, I just wanted to be happy. I just wanted to be happy. So, over 32 years of medical practice, I have been involved as an attending, more often as a consultant, in a handful of cases of sexual assault with a teenage girl as victim. In one of those cases, my only role was to sit with mom in the consultation room while the medical staff were completing the forensic uh, exam of the daughter who had been assaulted. And as soon as I came in the room, it was just mom and me, as soon as I came in the room, mom said, I knew I should have let her go. It was a frat party at the college. She's 15 years old. I knew I should have let her go. And you want to shake mom and say, well, then why'd you let her go? But of course, I did not do that because I knew the answer. She wanted to be her daughter's best friend. And a friend cannot command. And her daughter had assured her everything would be fine. Look, if you are doing your job as a parent, you will do things that your child does not approve of. Part of your job. Better answer came from a mom I met with in Tampa, Florida. Her daughter came to her and said, Hey, I'm going to Cancun for spring break. And mom looked at her phone and said, Why? Well, I can't get away that week. I'm busy. Her daughter said, I didn't say you were going to Cancun for spring break. I'm going to Cancun for spring break. Me and my friends. And it's a very affluent family. Mom couldn't claim that she couldn't afford it. And mom said, You're 14 years old. You're going to Cancun? with a bunch of 14 year olds, I don't think it's safe. And everybody said, oh, it's fine, it'll be totally safe, we'll be fine, we'll stay together, we'll have our phones, totally fine. And I said, no, I, I don't think it's a, I thought we had another 10 minutes. <laughs> oh well. 
Is that the call to prayer? Yes, just the call. Do we stop now or do we have a few minutes? You have five minutes. Okay. All right. Um, so mom said, no, you're not going. And she told me her daughter exploded. Her daughter started screaming at her, shouting, saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. You're going to like totally ruin my whole life. And mom responded, mom said, well, to be honest, sometimes I'm not so fond of you either. But she said, I am your mother. And that's a job. It has a job description. And my job is to keep you safe. And I know more than you do about the behavior of drunk college men. You're not going. If you're doing the right thing as a parent, you will do things that your child does not approve of. That's part of your job. Don't be confused. Don't be a typical American parent. There's any number of kids out there who can be your kid's best friend, but none of them can be the parent. That's your job. Okay, we're going to race through this in the um, interest of time. Um, last chapter of the collapse of parenting is taught of the meaning of life. You have to impart to your child a sense of life that's more about what college you go to or how much money you earn, because without that meaning, there's no point. And working hard to earn great marks just becomes a race to nowhere. To borrow the title of the documentary, making that point, the result is anxiety, depression, and disengagement. But you can't just be the Irish setter dad if you haven't first educated desire. I ask students, what is school for? And American high school students typically say, what's well, to get a good college? And I'll say, what is college for? They'll say, to get a good job. I say, well, what's the point of that? I said, to earn lots of money, have, have fun. So when I visited Shore in Sydney, Australia, I met with the head of school, spent two days there. I had a lot of time just with Dr. Wright. And he said, ask me some of the questions that you're going to ask the students. I said, all right, what is school for? He said, it is preparation for life. I said, all right, what is life for? And he answered without hesitation. He said, human life is for three things. Meaningful work, a person to love, and a cause to embrace. OK. That's an answer. I'm not saying it is the answer, but that's what an answer feels like. It has to be more than getting into a good college or earning lots of money. Those answers will not satisfy. We began with the question, why are American kids today so much more likely to be anxious, depressed, or disengaged compared to American kids 30 years ago? What can we do about it? My answers are that parents have allowed relations with same-age peers to displace the family, but you can change that. They've allowed screens to displace real-world experience, but you can change that. American parents are largely failing to teach virtue and character with authority. But you can change them. Again, there's more in the four books. And I hope you'll spread the word. If you know of any group that would be interested in this, I hope you'll come up to me and let me know. The handout is online. It is www.leonardsachs.com slash MFS, Muslim Family Services, .pdf. It is all lowercase. It is case sensitive. My contact information is in the handout. Uh, and you must include the www in the .pdf. Most common mistake uh, people make is they fail to do that. All right. Um, I believe we're going to have to adjourn about five minutes earlier than I thought. But I'm not going anywhere. I'll hang out for anybody who has uh, questions. Uh, but uh, let's adjourn now so everyone can get to prayer. Thank you very much. doing this talk tomorrow in Warren, Michigan, and in Canton, C-A-N-T-O-N, yeah, I, I, something like that, uh, MCWS and Iona, right, thank you, did you want to make an announcement? Yes, okay, on behalf of IUDD, I would like to thank you, Dr. Sachs, and the entire community who was uh, here to listen to the lecture, thank you very much, how are you?